Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome uh, to what's become a semi-annual event. We have one of these programs each semester at the Kupferberg Holocaust Center. Uh, to give you a lesson in history, uh, seven years ago, when I started this project, I could only get four students uh, who would want to participate in this program. And over the years, we are happily in the situation of having a waiting list of people to come in. What I also enjoy so much about this is that it's not only something I see where students learn, and you've been very fortunate this semester having Marissa Berman in charge of the internship program, but not only students learning about the Holocaust, but what I look for the most, and I'm never ever disappointed, is that our students develop relationships with our survivors. I have survivors who tell me that they get birthday cards, that they get flowers, that they get emails because of the connection that they have made with the, super, with the survivor. It becomes a very, very powerful, powerful situation that we have here. And what I'd like to do is ask Marissa uh, to take charge and begin the program and watch what happens when your fellow interns get up and speak about the people that they have had a chance to meet. Watch the change that takes place. Marissa. Thank you. All right, well, welcome everybody. We're here to celebrate the spring 2014 Holocaust interns. It's been a very long and very good semester. We learned a lot of information. Um, the students have worked really hard learning about the Holocaust and about what was happening during World War II in Europe. I want to thank Dr. Flug, first of all, for hiring me here, but also for putting me in charge of this internship program. This is my third semester running it, and it's really such a privilege. When I came here, I didn't really know too much about the Holocaust. Uh, you know, I knew some things that I learned in high school, maybe in school over the years, but I've learned so much, and it is Teaching the Holocaust and learning about the Holocaust weighs heavily on your soul. It's not easy to do every day. It really is very emotionally draining. And I see that in the students' expressions all the time when they leave, that sigh that they let out when they walk out the door because it's such a tough subject, but it's so important for us to study. And I'm so grateful that I've had this opportunity to learn more about it myself and then to continue teaching it. It's, it's really, it's just such a privilege. I also want to thank um, Rosemary Zins, the VP of Institutional Advancement, and of course, Dr. Call for bringing me on here and for just letting this Holocaust Center exist. It is such a vital component of this college and it really has done such amazing things. We are joining with so many faculty members here at the college in all different departments and it's really wonderful to see how much students can connect to this topic and especially to our survivors. I'm really proud of the students this semester and what they accomplished, and I'm really excited to hear them speak and to see what, what they learned about. So I just wanna recap on what the program is. We meet for the entire semester, so about 12 weeks, for one hour a day, um, once a week, and we do an intensive history, starting with before the Holocaust, during, after. We try and delve into all the different aspects of it. We watch videos, we look at historic photographs, we tour the exhibits. I give them books to read, articles, things like that. We have a lot of discussions. And we do that across the entire semester. And then the culmination of the project is the students get assigned a Holocaust survivor that they get to interview one-on-one. -on -one. And this is the most important part. I say this to students all the time, but we are so lucky to live right now that we get the opportunity to speak directly to survivors because we may not have that opportunity for much longer. So it's so important. You guys are so lucky that you got this experience because five, 10 years, people won't. So it's up to you to keep telling these stories. So I'm gonna invite up the first uh, student, Angelica, and her survivor, Ellen. And what I'm gonna ask is for you to just introduce yourself, tell us what your major is here, and what semester you're in, and then you can join right in, okay? So let's hear it for Angelica. <laughs>
Hi, my name is Angelica Hartran. My major is education and it is my second semester here at Queensboro. Good afternoon, everyone. I had the honor of interviewing Ms. Ellen Zilka, who is with us here today. Thank you for coming. Ms. Ellen was born in October 1928 in Berlin, Germany. Ms. Ellen attended school because her brother was too young. A sweet memory during Ms. Ellen's school was in the summer, everyone had to stay in their uniform, which made it extra hot. They had to keep their hats on because they knew a teacher was taking the same route with them. When the teacher passed by, they quickly took their hats off. Miss Ellen enjoyed being with people. Her favorite memory of school was being on the sports team. She became an empire and had tennis matches with other schools. Miss Ellen enjoyed being with people. Her favorite memory of school was being on the sports team. Her least favorite memory of school was the long commute, which was quite a distance from where she lived in England. Miss Ellen had memorable memories of visiting her family on her mother's side in Berlin, Cologne. But it was terribly bombed during the war. She said life was good until the Nazis came and the laws became very strict. On her father's side, he had one sister in eastern Germany and Miss Ellen would visit her sister once a year during the holidays. Miss Ellen lived in a cottage in England. Two were attached into one house and the third had an English family that were evacuated from London. Because of the bombing, the daughter living there was of the same age as Miss Ellen, so she traveled with her during the commute to school. On weekends, Miss Ellen would walk to dance performances. It was so rural that there was no electricity and no indoor plumbing because England was busy, busy being at war, so all the projects were stuck. Miss Ellen had to drop her middle name because she didn't want to advertise it. She had to give up her apartment by force because she was Jewish. Jewish. She had to share an apartment with another family. In England, people who came from Europe were called refugees. Miss Ellen was treated very well, like novelties. Teachers went out of their way to respect their religion and customs. For example, in school, a religious service followed in the morning by the Jewish children. They were excused from attending, which I found very respectful. When the war ended in England, she remembered D-Day when America and the British invaded in June, in June 6th. Miss Ellen heard airplanes in the air on an, a morning going to school. She knew it was coming to an end and the signs of surrender. Miss Ellen came with the kinder transport. When Hitler first came to power, he didn't want any Jews in Germany. In fact, he encouraged them to leave, leave around 1933. A few people said it was a, it was a passing thing, that nothing was going to happen. But her father had been in World War I. Laws became worse, and it became harder to get out. It became harder to get out that no one couldn't imagine what Hitler was going to do. Many were not able to receive their visas to get out of Germany. Then came November 9, 1939, the Crystal Knot. Then many realized things would get bad. This was a time when Nazi Germany's first large-scale physical act of anti-Jewish violence begins. This is when Miss Ellen moved to the center city. Somehow, a close relative close to her mother applied for Miss Ellen and her brother to go to the kinder transport in June 1939. Her brother, who was five years old, was sent to a Jewish family that no children in the north of England called Derby. And Miss Ellen came to a retired hospital administrator. She was very kind and made arrangements to have a girl who was the daughter of a Jewish couple to spend the school year with her. Miss Ellen visited her brother every year at Passover during spring and Easter vacation by train. Hearing about the Nazis, Miss Ellen was a child, five or six years old. There was no TV, but heard Hitler's ravens on the radio and in the streets. The parents did not take it seriously. In November 9, November 9 1939, her father was sent to a concentration camp, but he came back. When World War II started, Miss Ellen received a postcard saying that they were sent east of Germany. When the mail stopped, she found out her parents were shot, taken in the hands of the Nazis. 
During this time, people made many inquiries through the Red Cross. Miss Ellen taught me the term of sacrifice and what her parents did for her. Her brother went through a lot of things. He lived a very unhappy life, but he had many ideas. Even though he was laid off from his job, he had a terrible divorce, but this contrib all contributed to his unhappiness. At the age of 73, he took his own life and committed suicide. Miss Ellen is very brave. That is why she is a survivor. Um, a quote that I will leave with everyone today is by Eli Wiesel, which is, without memory, there is no culture. Without memory, there will be no civilization, no society, or no future. Um, I just want to thank Miss Marissa for giving me the opportunity for this internship. I learned a lot of information. It was a great experience, and I want to thank Miss Ellen for coming because she taught me to always cherish your family and to be a good person. And she taught me to keep the memory alive and appreciate what you have. thank Angelica. We had a long, long discussion and interview, and she was the best prepared student I've ever had. Thank you. <laughs> and, char and charming. And I got a bonus because her brother also oh, yes. came, and, and he had experiences, and we exchanged ideas, and Angelica's mother's here. Where are you? <laughs> and I thank her for coming. And you should be proud of both of your children. Thank you, dear. So um, we want to give you your certificate. and uh, Mom, why don't you come up? <laughs> why not? Come on. Okay. Okay. Uh, each one of you is going to get a citation. But some of these internships have been set up in memory of people who we've worked with, people who are survivors. And this particular internship was set up in memory of Sally Sachs. Now, those of you who are survivors all know Sally. Just a few brief words about Sally. Sally died two years ago. Uh, she came from Poland, lost her entire family, went through a series of concentration camps. Uh, she was probably, I won't say probably, she was the toughest woman I have ever met, uh, both emotionally and physically. I, I always told people that if I sat down at the table and Sally said, put your arm up like this and we'll arm wrestle, she would pin me with that a second <laughs> thought. She was that strong. But when Sally's true feelings came out about how she resisted was when one of our instructors, uh, Professor Lorraine Capelli from the nursing department, brought in a group of nursing students to meet with our survivors, for these survivors to tell them what there was like, what stress is like, what trauma is like. Sally said something. She said, you speak to the people around here and you will fully understand how much pain the human body could stand. She said, you will understand how much pain and suffering the human body could stand an amazing woman and her children who were not able to be here today have endowed this. So let's take a picture. <laughs> Dr. Cole, would you like to? All right, great. So our next student that's going to come up is Anna. And her survivor was Anita. You want to come on up? <laughs> so again, just you know, introduce yourself, your, your major you, that you graduated and, and all that good stuff. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Kim, and I am an education major, and this is my third semester here at Queensboro. I've had the honor to interview Ms. Anita Weisbord last Saturday, and this is my final reflection of the interview. Just a little louder, okay. <laughs> Anita still remembers the day her mother put her on a train from Austria to England in 1939. Though she had to wait an excruciating four hours until the train took off, that wasn't long enough to prepare young Anita, who was only 15 years old, to be separated from her own mother and be sent to a world unknown. She had no idea what was coming ahead, but she knew one thing. 
Her home was no longer the safe and dreamy place she had hoped it would be. Anita Weisbord is one of the children of Kinder Transport, a rescue operation which saved the lives of over 10,000 Jewish children from Nazi Germany by transporting them via train to England where they were adopted by British families. Often the children that were sent were the only members of their families who survived the Holocaust. But luckily for Anita's case, all the members of her family managed to survive and later be united. Anita was born in March 1, 1923, and grew up in the city of Vienna, Austria. She was raised in a loving Orthodox Jewish home with her parents and her elder siblings, Ernst and Hertha. Her father owned a knitting factory while her mother remained home. Growing up, Anita had a wonderful childhood and had many friends, Jewish and non-Jewish alike. After Adolf Hitler's rise in power, Jews faced harsh discrimination and were socially targeted, but it wasn't until the Night of the Broken Glass, also known as the Crystal Night, when Anita and her family's faith turned upside down and all hell broke loose. On the night of Crystal Night on November 9, 1937, 91 Jews were killed in the attacks. Homes, hospitals, and schools were ransacked, and more than 1,000 synagogues you, were me. burned down. Can I ask you to stop? We need... <laughs> <laughs> I want to give you some stuff. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was just, it's a little hard to hear, so we're going to just separate it. Sorry to throw you off. I won't start from all the way to the beginning. <laughs> I won't. Okay. Anita Weisbord is one of the children of Kinder Transport, a rescue operation which saved the lives of over 10,000 Jewish children from Nazi Germany by transporting them via train to England, where they were adopted by British families. Often the children that were sent were the only members of their families who survived the Holocaust. But luckily for Anita's case, all the members of her family managed to survive and later reunited. Anita was born in March 1st, 1923 and grew up in the city of Vienna, Austria. She was raised in a loving Orthodox Jewish home with her parents and her elder siblings, Ernst and Herda. Her father owned a knitting factory while her mother remained home. Growing up, Anita had a wonderful childhood and had many friends, Jewish and non-Jewish alike. After Adolf Hitler's rise in power, Jews faced harsh discrimination and were socially targeted. But it wasn't until the night of the broken glass, also known as the Crystal Night, when Anita and her family's fate turned upside down and all hell broke loose. On the night of Crystal Night on November 9, 1937, 91 Jews were killed in the attacks. Homes, hospitals, and schools were ransacked, and more than 1,000 synagogues were burned down, while thousands of Jewish businesses were destroyed. More than 30,000 Jews were arrested, and tens of thousands were imprisoned in concentration camps, including Anita's father. This was the start of Hitler's final solution. The scariest part of all this is, according to Anita, that the rest of the world remained silent. Not, on, not a single country attested or stepped in to point finger at this atrocity that was happening at the hands of a single evil man. This ignorance, the notion of being unaware, although physically is not harmful, can be an enabler of something so evil I can say that it is the root of evil that is happening around the world today. And we must not only bear witness, but take action and respond to the pain and suffering of those around us. On November 21st, 1938, Britain agreed to take in the children threatened by the Nazi murder program. Agencies were set up that promised homes for all the children up to the age of 17 and they could stay in the country temporarily. We don't know how, but Anita's mother managed to get Anita on the list of the rescue operation. She met the age restriction, but her sister Herda did not, being that she was over 18. However, Herda was able to come to England, as well as a domestic maid and her brother too, when he joined the Foreign Legion. One of the most memorable part of my interview is 
when Anita described the day when she was departed off to England. Even until this day, Anita cannot bear to see anyone off. Perhaps it's the horror of being separated from her mother that still, still haunts her till this day. What's more memorable is that Anita said this, my mother gave birth to me twice. Once was when she bore me out of her belly, and another is when she scurried up the strength and foresight to send me off to England via kinder transport. I cannot imagine the heart-wrenching pain that Anita's mother must have felt sending off her precious daughter into a strange country. But she knew that was the wise thing to do when she was absolutely uncertain what would happen to Anita and even herself in the terror of Hitler's regime. Anita and her mother had no clue whether they would ever meet again. And the numbers were horrible. 90% of the children in kinder transport they did not see their parents again. Anita was lodged by Mrs. Butcher. Mrs. Butcher's son was a member in the British Parliament. Anita was sent as an elderly companion. Adjusting to a life in England was difficult. She had to learn a whole new language, and adapting to a foreign culture was not an easy task for young Anita, especially without the support of her family. Anita, rec Anita recalled that she was always very hungry as a growing teenager with a voracious appetite, being only met with small, tiny tea sandwiches and little portions of an elderly woman. She wanted more food, but could not dare to ask for more from the fear of upsetting Mrs. Butcher or any other, the fear of being sent back to Austria. Even though Anita was far from the Nazis and Hitler, she did not feel at home as the horror of being persecuted and from what she saw back at home haunted her for a very long time, especially when she didn't know about the whereabouts of her parents. She was in the arms of total strangers. Anita recalled receiving a letter from the Red Cross after the war had ended. She said, she trembled and hesitated to opening it for a long time because the letter would tell her whether her parents were alive or dead. Luckily, her parents had survived and were safe. Despite being split from her loved ones, Anita pushed on board, learning to adapt to her new surroundings, keeping herself together, and unknowingly becoming a strong, resilient woman that she is today. She met her husband in England and the two moved to America and started a family of their own. She had two children, a son and a daughter, and she is now a grandmother to a four beautiful grandchildren. Anita lives each day with a new light. Having escaped death at a young age, Anita doesn't like to waste a single moment. If not used to inspire others or share her thankfulness with the members of her family and the community, she is now a well-spoken advocate and an educator of the Kinder Transport. She is the Vice President of the Kinder Transport Association and the President of the Queen Long Island Chapter. Anita is also an active member of the Cuthbert Holocaust Center, and she has participated in the student internship program several times already. As a woman in her 90s, it's so amazing to see her unyielding energy and passion to be involved and spreading awareness for the young generation. Her participation in this interview with me showed me just how much she cares about the social injustice going around the world today. She told me that through this internship, she would like more people be to become not just aware of the Holocaust, but also of other war crimes and atrocities that are happening in other nations currently. Anita keeps herself so busy that I've come to a conclusion that that must be the reason for her blissful youth, even in her 90s. <laughs> Age cannot simply catch up to a woman who's so busy living life to fullest, doing charity work, simply enjoying life, and sharing her inspiring stories to others. Anita left me with the last remark by showing me one of the quotes she had read in a book. And it goes like this. 
Still, while no man is responsible for what his ancestors have done, he is responsible for what he does with that memory. I want to take this time to promise to Anita that I will not just remember her story, but use her story to inspire others, raise more awareness, more importantly, I, myself, to become a more humble, grateful individual, to appreciate simple joys of life, including my families. Thank you. Our meeting end was really a pleasure. And she said to me that she's going to be a teacher. It'll be more exciting because now she heard first-hand testimony. It make it so much better and easier to teach it to the next generation. Well, I must say, Dr. Flope Marissa, he did a wonderful job because she was so excited of learning about the Holocaust. It meant so much to her, and I'm very grateful to you that you feel that way, and I hope you will remember the story, tell it to your children, because we must never forget. Thank you. Anna, before you go, here's your certificate. Before you, don't go yet. <laughs> don't go yet. Now, this particular internship was endowed uh, by Dr. Marlene Blumen, um, and it is called the Joanne Blumen Internship Project. Maybe you'd like to say a few words about it. Um, certainly, the, the love that I have for my sister was supreme, but if I think about my sister, I think of the characteristics of her persistence and her resilience, and I think that is so awe-inspiring when I see those two characteristics in survivors, and whether the genocide is um, from the Holocaust or uh, from whatever um, man's inhumanity to man, I'm so honored that this is going to continue the education of those events. Great. Hi everyone, my name is Daron Bernholtz, and this is my last semester at Queensborough. I wanted to start off by saying thank you to Marissa for furthering my knowledge on the Holocaust. Although I went to Poland and I am Jewish, I still learned a lot from the sessions we had throughout the semester. I was very happy to hear that they are offering such an internship on campus. It is great to raise awareness and teach young students of the events that occurred in Europe not so long ago. Unfortunately, there is still a lot of anti-Semitism all over the world, and by having the survivors share their stories, it allows us to learn and hopefully prevent having these kinds of events from occurring again. And since we're already talking about the Holocaust, and that's why we're here, just last week, I don't know if you heard, but on the news, there was a cab driver driving around with a armband, a swastika armband. You know, so it's good we're talking about it, raising awareness and letting people know that it did happen and people were trying to deny it. So that's that. I also wanted to thank uh, Sam Wadowski for making the time, allowing me to interview him and giving me the opportunity to hear his touching story. Like Marissa said, unfortunately, he's not here because of uh, Shavuot, which is a Jewish holiday. Um, so it was very tough for me to go and interview him. But before I started <clears throat> interviewing Sam, I didn't know how I'd be able to ask him about his experience in Auschwitz. But I knew this might be the only chance I ever have to speak to a survivor face to face that I got sent to a death camp and saw his family get sent to die right in front of his very own eyes. I can't even picture myself being in such a situation. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Sam and the life he had growing up in Poland and the different camps he was sent to. <clears throat> so Sam's real name is Shmuel. Um, in English it's Sam Wadowski. He was born in 1925 in Skunskowola, and uh, that's a small town in Poland. And from there he moved to a bigger city called Lodz. Um, he had a mother, uh, her name was Bella, and his father died when he was two and a half years old. So already from then, they already had like a tough life, you know, have, being a single parent, with having seven siblings as well. They lived in a Jewish community, and most of his friends were Jewish, and they kept kosher, like, and did all the Jewish traditions, as well as getting sent to yeshiva, which is a Jewish school. Um. <laughs> Uh, 
they spent most of their weekends um, hanging out, you know, with the family, spending a lot of time together. He did have other family members in Poland, but because of communication and, you know, travel situations, it was hard for them to, like, really stay in touch so much. But um, a, an event that really stuck out to him that he kept on repeating over and over again was on September 1st, Friday morning, 1939. I quote, I will never forget. The Germans started to occupy Poland. There were air raids and bombings. He had to go into shelters and wait for clearance. And they were basically, that's when the Germans were attacking and he had to go into hiding. Right away, he felt like the war was against the Jews. And again, he repeated, there were several things that he repeated over and over again that you knew that it really like stuck to him. Um, he also couldn't go, like Jews couldn't go to school anymore. They couldn't buy shoes. And um, it was a complete turnaround from day to night. And over the time, he felt like it was systematically worse, just getting worse and worse. The mood in the neighborhood got very bad. There were long lines for food, and German soldiers were roaming the streets. He right away realized at that point that the situation was escalating and getting bad. And luckily, his brother realized that in advance, and he didn't want to go into hiding. So he, he was, um, I guess you could say, smart enough to flee to Russia. And he was uh, able to survive his brother. Um, after that, they started uh, taking all the Jews and putting them in ghettos. They organized them in the town of Lodz, and he lived there from 1940 to 1944. They, all, they put him in an area in the poor section over there, and over there, like the Jews basically, he was telling me they ran the place, they had their own like police force, firefighters, and people had jobs. You know, and obviously they didn't get paid, and the conditions were very tough over there. Although the jobs were very tough, he actually enjoyed what he did because he said it was considered a good job. He dealt with uh, distributing um, clothes in the clothing distribution. So that was good because it kept him busy, and a lot of people didn't even have jobs, and they were... They just were kind of losing their mind, you know, just having nothing to do, going from like a normal life to doing nothing and being isolated in a very condensed small area. At the age of 19, Sam was moved to Auschwitz. At first, they told them they were taking them to work in a different place. He said the train ride lasted all night and they were all scared because they had no idea what was going on. He said it was like being blindfolded. When they got off the train, they were told to leave their items behind. They were shouting at them, and they were petrified. It was like, like I said, being blindfolded. He saw Eichmann was standing direct, directly in front of them, telling people to go to the left and right. And the left meant death, which meaning they were going to die in the crematoriums. Uh, Sam and his brother-in-law were the only ones that were the ones that survived. The rest of his family got sent to the crematoriums, besides his brother, who was able to flee before. And at that point, when Sam was telling me this, he kind of like broke down in a way and it was very hard for him to continue telling me the story. You know, even though it happened like so long ago, um, I felt like he just, it was tough for him. And he told me his um, nephews and nieces made a DVD, they interviewed him. And from that point on, like, I didn't want to push it because I know it's a very sensitive topic, especially, you know, my grandma is also a survivor. So like, even when I ask her questions, it's uh, kind of tough. So he gave me a DVD and the rest of the, questions and things that I had, I tried to absorb as much as I could from the DVD that I watched. Um, but a little bit more about Auschwitz that he told me. Um, his whole family and his brother got sent to the right, pretty much. And then that first day they got there, they all left them in the hot sun without water, no food. He said having no water was, have, is, was worse than having no food because the sun was just beaming down on them and they were just left in the field. Um, then they split them up into their bunk beds, uh, into their dorms where they would be sleeping. There was about a thousand people in one dorm, and they all had to fight for a small section. That's where him and his brother-in-law um, joined another four people, and it became the six of them as like a little team that they stuck together. The food was scarce, though, and he was telling me how they got one bowl for six people with one spoon and one cup for food. and. 
basically that's where we stopped talking about Auschwitz because it was just tough for him. Um, after Auschwitz, this is from the DVD, after spending three weeks in Auschwitz, he got sent on a six-day train journey to Germany that he worked for a farmer. Sam says this was the best camp he could have got sent to because the labor wasn't so hard. After he got, was working on the farm for a few weeks, he got sent to work somewhere else. They sent him to work in a different camp, which was to unload cement. Right away when he got there, he knew that if he stayed there, he was not going to survive. So Sam's a smart guy. He told, he made believe like he was sick, and they sent him back to a different camp where the conditions were better. Um, after the war, Sam got married at the age of 22, and he met his wife through his brother-in-law. Even though his brother, his sister's, his sister's husband was with them through the whole time. Luckily, they were able to stay together, and he met his wife through his brother-in-law. He moved to the Bronx, and he said life for moving from Europe to America was not easy because he had no family support, and he had no money as well. Um, I asked him why didn't he move to Israel, and he said it wasn't the best time to move to Israel because it was the they were going through independence in 1948, and it still wasn't established. Um, one other thing I want to say, being a part of, the in of this internship con contributed so much to my knowledge on the Holocaust. Even though I am Jewish, there are a lot of things that I learned throughout our sessions. When I originally signed up for this internship, I thought I would l just learn more information about the horrific, horrific events and continue on with my day. But more than ever, it really affected me even after I walked out of the Kuf Cooper Ferberg building. It really got to me thinking about my grandmother who managed to flee Poland on her own at the age of 14 and survive. My grandfather did the same, but I was very young, so I don't really recall his stories. And one of the stories I do remember that is um, that I heard from my parents is as he was explaining about the Holocaust in his family, his, he wanted to take his little sister with him to, to Russia. You know, and his parents said she's too young. And the second he said that, my dad told me he turned pale white and he just fainted. And ever since then, he didn't talk about it. So it's good that we have survivors who are strong. Not saying that my grandfather wasn't strong, but you know, it's very good and courageous that you guys are willing to speak and go on and tell us the stories. Ever, so, ever since I started learning about the Holocaust again, I try to keep in touch with my grandmother more often who currently lives in Israel. Besides that, I also try to wa raise awareness about the events that occurred not long ago. It is extremely important to keep learning about the Holocaust, especially with the amount of anti-Semitism going on in the world. The part that touched me the most was the book we had to read, named Frederick, which is a book, it has a bunch of short stories about a kid named Frederick, how he had a normal life, and then gradually how it escalated and got so much worse. And when I was reading it, it was hard for me to read it all at once, because it was just like so devastating to hear and like try to put myself in that situation. Um. <clears throat> so one other thing. A couple of weeks ago, I attended the Ali Wiesel talk in the 92nd Street Y, and he touched on the topic of anti-Semitism. Just like Ali said, I also never understood why people hate the Jews. Ali said something along the lines, they hate us because we are successful, but they also hate us because we are poor. There isn't a solid reason why someone could hate, can or should hate a whole race. Um, that was my conclusion of my interviewing Sam, and I really enjoyed doing this. And one other thing I want to say, I admire all you survivors, you know, for being strong enough, and some of you were on the kinder transport, some of you did managed to flee and because of you I am here and the Jewish people have a country and I really admire all of you for being strong enough to you know survive and thank you very much Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zephyr Blanco. Uh, I'm. It's currently my second year here at Queensboro, and I'm uh, majoring in liberal arts and science. Um, I had the pleasure of interviewing Hanny Liebman um, over the phone, which is quite interesting. Uh, I actually just met her this morning, and 
just like meeting her was a great opportunity and she seems like a very strong um, strong intelligent and motivated individual um, but a little bit about Hanny um, Hanny was born in Germany um, she recalls uh, like being in school, like when she first started school as a, a six-year-old, and um, seeing things in Germany progress, like how it, everything got worse, like after, like the the Nazi regime started taking over, and um, she said it greatly affected her because um, many of her friends, many of her German friends, um, they would stop talking to her. Like the teacher would treat her differently because she was because of her religion, because she was Jewish, and. Um, and uh, and Hanny and her family like kind of got the general knowledge of what was going on prior to all this because she did live like right next door to a socialist newspaper. Um, and yeah, um, Hanny and her family were taken to a French concentration camp, like in the so-called uh, Southern Free France, and um, and she remembers. Like the details that she told me over the phone were just amazing. It was like chilling, and um, it was very emotionally touching for me. Um, she remembers the, the transport there. Like um, she remembers the oldest person on the on the train. She remembers the youngest person on the train. Um, she remembers going um, three days uh, without water or food, and. Um, and yeah, and as well as uh, her her experience at a, at the concentration camp, how she said that um, she clearly vividly remembers um, like how like the first person like in her barrack how she died and and I don't know I just thought it was like very touching and and yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, Hanny was rescued by an organization called OSE, which was a group of uh, Jewish people. Uh, Jewish individuals as well as non-Jewish individuals, and like Protestants and many different groups of um, like people to um, help out the people in the concentration camps. Um, she escaped with the help of this organization. She escaped to Switzerland, um, and it was still hard for her. Like you'd think that go, like being free and going to a different country is going to be easy. It was it was definitely still hard for her. Um, like going to a refugee country with a, not even a penny in your pocket is like not many people like like look to help help you if you have no money. Um, um, so yeah, um, in Switzerland, this is a little like this was. This like how Miao like calmed me down. Like she did say that um, she met a boy in her concentration camp, and she met up with him after after her after this boy attempted twice to go into Switzerland. She she finally met up with him, uh, and they got married. And um, a few years later, they had um, a child, and they moved to New York. And she's actually. A nomad, uh, I like to say. Um, she went from moving to Manhattan, to Astoria, to Bayside, to Fresh Meadows, and Jackson Heights, and and yeah, she's as she says, like, she knows how to pack uh, her bags and move like pretty well. Um, and yeah, this experience, um, to be quite honest with you, was a, a great. Um, it's a great program to have at our school at QCC, and um, it's definitely something that many students should take advantage of. Um, I personally, like uh, my whole educational career um, in high school, like I've been, just been taught, like being told that, oh, life and life during the Holocaust was horrible for the survivors, and okay, yeah, but I never really got that that um, privilege of interviewing someone and having um, firsthand. Um, a first-hand witness, like to tell me what life was like, and and like such a tragic, um, like period of time in our human history, um, and yeah. With all this said, um, uh, I personally think Hanny is, I I look I look up to her like, um, like for being a uh, intelligent, um, um, 
individual, motivated, um, and very courageous. Um, and I just, I just think it was great how she overcame all these struggles, like with the transportation, with the concentra uh, concentration camps, um, moving to New York, learning a different language, and it's, it's definitely something to look up to. And, and yeah, the word should definitely be out there that these people are like amongst us. You never know if you you'll bump into them in the streets. You you never know like who's who's out there, and you should definitely acknowledge these people and 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 yeah, and look up to them. And yeah, this experience was overall it was a really nice experience, and I definitely recommend it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annie. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to say there is someone here, a friend of mine, who shared very much of our, my experience. Really, would you please? <laughs> we are friends since 1941. She shared much of my faith, her faith, and we have been good friends ever since, right? But what you should take away from all of that is not only the experience that we had, which was horrible, but also the wonderful experience we made, Willie and I, and many others, in the village of Le Chambon, where people treated us so well and were so determined to save our lives. And you should take away the fact that people can be good, and pe there are people who do not hate. And this is, I think, the greatest lesson everyone should learn, not to hate. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brian Kujilan, and I'm here studying nursing. This is my last semester. Um, pretty much, uh, you know, interviewing Jane Kaimel was a very, uh, how do you say, uh, rare but unique uh, experience, but it was very good. Uh, you know, I feel that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a miracle that, you know, these people are here today. Uh, so they're walking miracles. And, um, I'm gonna begin by, uh, you know, giving you a rundown on Jane Kaimel's story as a survivor. Uh, Jane Kaimel came from a wealthy family. Her father owned a department store with a huge variety of items for sale and the cafeteria for shoppers to go on and eat. Her family consisted of her mother, father, and sister. They lived in a, big, in a big home with six bedrooms. Before Hitler came into power and while in jail, he wrote a book named Mein Kampf. Hitler documented on his plan to extinguish all Jews in this book. When he came into power in 1933, James' father had to close the department store because German troops came in and laid down their sinister order. However, after a few days, Jane's father opened the department store and kept business up and running as usual. He had to support his family. In the meantime, a lot of chaos was going on in Germany. Synagogues and prayer books were destroyed. Jane's father decided to leave the country on November 10, 1938 and shut down the store for good. The options that Jane's father had to choose from was to evacuate was either to evacuate heading for Shanghai, China, or Cuba. And Cuba was his choice, since it was close to America. In 1939, the father bought four entry visas to get into Cuba at a total of $1,000. The German shipping company informed James' family that the ship would be leaving on May 13th, 1939. The name of the ship was called St. Louis and the captain's name behind it was pronounced as Schroeder. 
Jane mentioned that the captain of the ship pledged to treat everyone equally and did not agree with Hitler's views. By the time the ship arrived to Cuba, Jane and her family and many others on the ship were denied entry into Cuba. After finding out that the full price of the visas was not paid off somehow, for over a month, Jane's family and other Jews on the ship were stranded at sea with no other place to go. Telegrams from those aboard the ship were sent to President Franklin D. Roosevelt and asked for acceptance into America, but never received a reply. A telegram was also sent to Canada and still no reply. So most people on the boat, including Jane's family, only had a few pairs of clothing in their luggage with no money. The captain of the ship kept a diary and wrote on how he would never return the people back to Germany. With no other place to go for over 30 days, the captain, Schroeder, of the St. Louis ship began to head back to Europe. <coughs> on the way there, the captain tried his best to prevent anyone aboard the ship from trying to commit suicide by jumping off the boat. The captain crossed the English Channel between England, France, Belgium, and Holland. And in France, the country was willing to accept one quarter of the people aboard the ship. And Jane and her family happened to be one of them. By the time the war broke out spreading from Germany to France, Belgium, and Holland, Jane's father managed to get her sister and her out of France on a French ship to America in December 24th, 1939. They avoided Hitler's rule and finally landed in America on January 5th, 1940. Jane would never forget all the tension and heartaches that she went through during the voyages on the ship. At night, all lights would be completely off as they sailed with the intention to be undetected by any other attackers. Could you imagine the pain that she must have felt while she was on the boat? Not only Jane, but everyone else on that ship. She, was, uh, she also will not forget how her grandmother, who was blind, was not allowed to leave the country and was placed in a concentration camp. It haunts her until this day how her grandmother may have been exterminated in the concentration camp. The feelings that this kind of situation has put her through is unforgettable. And she also has told me to never forget. You know, this experience for me reminded me of a time years ago when I was interviewed. I mean, when I actually spoke to uh, an elder woman, she was like a grandmother to me. And she had told me how, you know, the streets were once all dirt. There was chickens running around. There was, you know, there was no gravel on the on the street where she lived on. And I remember listening to that story. How, you know, I felt an emotion of her telling me that. Now, the way this reminds me, you know, of Jane's story is that, you know, you know, there's just some things that can't be forgotten. And in a situation like this, not only can Jane, you know, not only will Jane ever forget this, but so many other people in the world who experienced the Holocaust situation will also never forget what happened. And you know, it's, um, it's something that should always be talked about, and I agree that uh, you know, hatred is something that uh, you know, should never exist, and you know, but there will always be good and evil forces, but uh, you know, God willing, the good will always prevail. And, um, you know, it's also very good that Jane was able to avoid uh, getting placed into a concentration camp by actually, uh, you know, boarding a ship and um, landed in France. And once the war broke out, she, you know, she ended up, you know, boarding the ship and arriving at America. So, you know, it's just, it's just a blessing, but it was still a struggle for Jane. You know, that, that year on the ship, the two years for her was, you know, could you imagine all the terror and everything that haunted her? So it was very, uh, it was very capturing. 
there are a few Holocaust survivors who are still alive today, and it has been, uh, it has been, uh, uh, it has been a pleasure to get to feel the, uh, you know, interviewing such a person with unique humor as Jane. Jane reminded me uh, also of, um, you know, a person that sends out a message without even, without even, you know, without even trying that you know, people have to be strong and, and intelligent. Um, you know, Jane is, is very smart and you're able to just feel it uh, right, you know, when you're speaking with her. You know, it's, it's just, um, it's something that, you know, that you, not anybody at, at, at this age, and, and even any age, you know, not, not all people have this, this wisdom, you know, and it's, it's important, to, uh, once again, to never forget what happened and you know, uh, everything is a blessing. <laughs> um, hello everyone, my name is Crystal Edward and this is my fourth semester at QCC. Um, I'm studying my preclinical classes for nursing and I had the great privilege to interview Ms. Etzel and I'll also thank Marissa for giving me the opportunity to meet her. I read Miss Ethel Katz's book when I was in high school. It's titled Wow, Tomorrow Never Came. And she became a great source of inspiration for me after I read that book. And I also met her that year. And I remember we were in the library and she was talking to us and I couldn't imagine how strong one has to be to tell such a story. When I found out that Ms. Eto volunteered at the Holocaust Center, I, I did not hesitate the one day to ask Marissa to speak to her again, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I'm just going to give you a rundown of Ms. Eto Katz's um, life, past story. Um, she's from Burkast. Right. Uh, it's a small town in eastern Poland. She has seven. She had seven members of her family. She had um, her parents, her oldest sister, a twin brother, and two younger brothers. She's the only survivor of her family. Miss um, Etukat's mother passed away before the war, and her oldest sister took care of the family and acted as loving and caring as a mother. Um, she told me that she will go to school and she was very good at art and she still is. She, when I went over to interview her, she showed me her sketchbook when she pretty much drew the whole the Holocaust experience where she was hiding and all the places she went. She also had a lot of friends growing up and two of them survived and she's still in contact with them still today. Um, Hitler marched in her town on July 5th, 1941, and the first day they murdered 100 Jews and destroyed all the synagogues. And since then, the laws has become even harder. The Jews had to wear armbands with a yellow Jewish star. There was a curfew, and things just got worse. In fall of 1942, Thousands of Jews were sent to a gas chambers. And it just, the horror just became worse. And in June 1943, the Jews had no right to exist. So Miss Eto's family was forced to leave the town and move out of the city to go into hiding. They were, they, they hid in different places they were hiding in someone's attic, and that person was very much taking care of them, giving them food. But she told me as the time passed by, they realized that the food was getting smaller, and the potatoes, and it was just not enough to feed the whole family. And she remembers, she told me, her older sister would shoot on one bit of potato because 
she was trying to leave more food for the rest of the kids. And that family eventually threw them out and they had nowhere to go, they had to hide. One of the most dangerous places that her family had to hit in was the green field. It was just a field and there was no walls, nothing, it was just a field there. They just decide there is nowhere to go and they They just laid in the field and there was workers, it's very dangerous. The last hiding place that her and her family went, it was in a farmhouse in the attic. Her family were captured there on March 8, 1944, and they were all murdered. She told me she, she was laying down on the snow injured and she opened her eyes and she saw the black boots standing over her. And she told me she closed her eyes and said her prayers. But when she realized that the boots had disappeared and she realized that the soldier was running after her two younger brothers that were trying to get away. She was laying down on the snow and the soldiers had left. They left her there cold, injured. She was rescued by the poli by some Polish teenagers. And two weeks after, the Russians liberated the area. She went back in the field with the help of the teenage Polish. She buried her whole family. And she went back to the city. She thought that everything was over since the Russian had liberated, but it was not. A week later, she had to hide again because Hitler had reoccupied <coughs> the area. She was all alone. She walked in the house in the attic and she found a fake wall. She said she was so grateful to find that fake wall. There was an opening in the wall. She opened it and stayed in there. She hid in there for four weeks. She was suffering with cold, she was cold. And she said her biggest problem was she was really thirsty. She was so thirsty that she couldn't even swallow anymore. And the house that she was hitting in, in the attic, the whole house was occupied by German soldiers. And she had to stay up there with no noise. She couldn't move. And the thirst was beginning to get so hard that she had to risk going down to find water. After those horrible four weeks hidden along in the attic, she was liberated on July 22, 1944. I just want to say, it takes a very strong woman to, to tell a such story. Um, I myself, I have a big family, and I do not want to imagine ever had to witness them being murdered. And me and Ed, Ms. Eto has a very unique connection because I myself is very religious and she is too. And she was telling me when she was hiding in the farmhouse with her family, they will stay and pray that it's, they will pray to God and ask for help and they will hope that everything will get better. And I remember for me as well, back in 2010, I was in the earthquake in Haiti. And I remember every night we would sleep outside for months and me and my family, me and my family will stay outside and we'll pray together and hope that everything gets better. Um, she, she means a lot to me and I have her book and I'll always cherish it. She, she gave me a quote actually. Thou shalt not stand in thee while thy neighbor's blood is shed. I'm very thankful that I met her, and I'll always remember her. She has a great heart and a lot of love to give. Thank you.
Thank you very much for absorbing my story. So you listen so carefully. It's very important to me because I remember when we were in a bunker in a very sad situation, the Gestapo was in front of us. We were saying goodbye to each other. My father said, who will tell the world what we are suffering? Well, I am grateful the young people listen and absorb my story and tell the world what we suffer. It's very important, as my father said, who will tell the story? Well, it's very sad story. I am glad that the young people, the, the following generations, are taking it over, listening carefully, and trying to make a better world. It should never happen again. What we're doing here, we're really teaching to value the humanity of all mankind. What we have to do, we have to respect your neighbors, nationality, religion, culture, language, whatever it is, and then we could live in peace together. I hope that people that listen to us understand what the Holocaust was, what the atrocities were, and it should never, should try to work. It should never happen again. We must work for a better world. world. Thank you very much. Having the experience of interviewing Hannah George, George, yeah. George um, have me analyze myself to be able to be stronger um, towards situations in life. At the beginning, I didn't want to be rude or insensitive while interviewing her because I know that these stories have a huge impact for all of us. It's a lot of suffering. So she suggests and we agree that she will start talking from the very beginning. And I just note everything that she said. So she started telling me that when, when Hitler became uh, president, she was five years old. Her, her father died, so her mother had to become the breadwinner. And she was raised by her grandmother and aunt. Um, she, uh, also that the place that she was renting with her family, the landlord was the first one to join forces with Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. So they were, she was no longer able to play with her daughter uh, at the apartment they were renting. And eventually they were kicked out there. Um, eventually Hitler made a uh, petition for the Jewish community to sign. And uh, one of her friends didn't want to sign the petition. She got killed because of that. When I put myself into that situation, taking the decision of life that I, I, I don't know why, what I would do in those moments like that. If I would sign the petition just to live more day, even though I might end up being in a concentration camps and die from starvation or just be embrace my religion and no sign it and just be you also be able to end the humiliation and the and the suffering. These are the these decisions that are really difficult to do, especially if you don't have anyone to support it. Furthermore time passes and she was able to manage to go to the child transport. 
among others. Um, by the time she was 14, I really admire her because she was like the oldest ones in the child transportation. And she was, even though I really admire her because she's really strong because I don't know what I would do, but she gathered all that, cor all that courage and be able to be there for the other ones that were in child transportation, introducing herself and looking for the other ones and to the to their destination to England to uh, I mean to to Ger uh, from Germany to England. Um, after a while in England, some of them have to flee because uh, England was no longer ta one, the wanting to take care of them. So they managed to move to an island. She told me that was Ireland. And she volunteered there, and she really became friends of this Polish girl that was really, really depressed because all these circumstances and losses that she had been living through the, go uh, through the influence of Adolf Hitler in Germany. One day, she went back to her room and she found a note from her that she couldn't she couldn't she couldn't deal with that no more with all that suffering as she commit suicide and jump from John McCliff. Um, after hearing all these story that that Hannah told me about her experiences, um, it gave me the power to not to crumble or problems that are not a big of a deal. It makes me realize we see faces, but we, we don't know their stories and what they have been through. After listening to ha Hannah's test testimony, I get to the conclusion that some people take life for granted, and they don't realize there are bigger things at hand than just our daily, daily life problems. We should be grateful for all opportunities we get in our life and realize that Hannah is a strong woman that was able to conquer all these obstacles at such a young age, as she's someone that I really admire. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katie Ruiz. This is my second year here at Queensborough, and I'm a liberal arts major. So I just want to thank Ms. Marissa for giving us the opportunity to learn more about the Holocaust and C-STEP for, for, for informing me that this opportunity was available. And I also want to thank you, Mr. Berger, for being here with us today. Um, so Mr. Steve Berger was born in Hungary in 1927. And when he was 16 years old, he, he was in high school at this time, and he was 16 years old. That's when Germany came, came and invaded Hungary. He had, a, he had to leave school and he had to stay at home with his mom and his sister. His father was taken months earlier before to become a human mind detector. So he would walk in front and if it was clear, the tanks could walk behind them. So from there, he, had, he received a letter that he had to move to the ghettos and with an option of bringing one knapsack each. What I thought was pretty amazing that he, since he didn't go to school, he saved all his books and put them in a box and he buried it in the backyard and he wanted them to wait for them until he returned to receive this book. So once he moved to the ghettos, um, they, packed, they packed the knapsacks with food and that only, that only lasted a couple of weeks. So he met up with two friends. He, he, yeah, he met up with two friends, and he had to find a situation to solve this food problem. So what he did was he would jump off of the ghettos, hide, and then at, when it was morning time, he would go into the market, buy food, wait until sundown, jump back into the ghetto for he could feed his mother and his sister. So they did this a couple of times and it was successful, until one time one of his neighbors caught him, and of course she called the police on him. And it was illegal for Jewish people to go buy anything or be even out in the market. So from there, one morning, the SS officers came, woke everyone up, and they all had a march to, to, the, to the railroad, and they were stuffed, 
in these cattle carts. There were about 100 to, to 120 people in each cart, and they were shipped to the, to the concentration camps. And this transportation lasted three and a half days. He was in these carts for three and a half days with no food, no water, there's no sanitary facilities. These babies were crying, the mothers were desperate, there's nothing to do, people were killing themselves, they were committing suicide, they were poisoning themselves. And he would say by the second day, he was delusional, he didn't know what was going on, he was so disoriented. He, he just wanted to lose it. But once they arrived to the concentration camp, they waited outside and then a German officer came with a truck with, and two civilians were inside. And they were demanding a mechanic. So he stepped up and he says, I'm a mechanic. And the guy looks at him and he goes, you're a mechanic? He goes, yeah, I'm a mechanic. Of course, Mr. Berger was 16 at the time. He looked really young at 16. And he goes, okay, get in the truck. He goes, I cannot go. Why not? I have my mother and my sister with me. I can't leave them behind. He goes, get in the truck. Didn't say anything. Get in the truck. Didn't say anything. As he was, as the officer was about to pull the gun out and shoot Mr. Berger, a civilian ran up to the survivor, to the, to the officer, whispered something in his ear, which made the officer change his idea, and said, "Okay, get in the truck. Bring your mom and your sister with you." So from there, he was sent to a labor camp. So. He was sent to a labor camp in Strass, it's called Strassoff in Vienna, and he was working the machinery. He was doing all this precise work, and he told the, one of the officers, he goes, I need glasses. He goes, what do you mean you need glasses? He goes, I'm doing precision work here. I need glasses. So he said, OK, Stefan, I'll talk to the commanding officer to see what they could do for you. So finally, they, they allowed him to go into the city to Vienna to get glasses for him. Once he walked into, once he walked into the, the doctor to get glasses, he see boxes and boxes of boxes filled with glasses. He goes, wow, where are these glasses coming from? And then the doctor told him, these are the glasses from Auschwitz. He goes, Auschwitz? He's never heard of Auschwitz before. It was the first time he's ever heard of Auschwitz. He goes, yes. And that's when he was informed of what was going on in Auschwitz. So finally, he went back to the camp. Then a couple of weeks later, there was a bombing in the commanding officer's villa. Great Britain has thrown bombs, but some of them didn't go off. So of course, they wanted Mr. Berger to go to their house and pick out these bombs. So he went to their house to pick out these bombs, and, and then he said that it was a lucky day for him. And I asked why. He goes, because when it came during lunchtime, everyone was eating their lunch. And the maid made me a sandwich. It was the first time I've had a sandwich in so long. He goes, he goes, food was so sacred there that you needed anything to eat in order to survive. So he goes, I was lucky. He goes, I had an extra day of life. Before I left back to the camp, I asked the maid, can you make me a sandwich for my mother and for my sister? Of course she made him a sandwich. And he, and he obviously gave it to them. And I just think it's amazing how Everyone has their specific stories and how one little detail or one little action gave you an extra day of life or it could have been just out of luck. But I just really want to thank everyone for coming out here and telling, you, telling us your stories. Thank you, Mr. Berger, for everything. Thank you so much. When I came to interview this young girl, I told my wife, there's a young girl, very intelligent, beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. My, my, my wife is very understanding. She said, <laughs> she said uh, it's OK, but keep your mind on the subject, <laughs> which I did. That's why you heard her story so well. <laughs> now, we survivors not, won't survive forever. But we have a young group of youngsters who will take over for us when we are gone. And I'm sure they will do a beautiful job 
because they know how important to remember history. History is the most important thing in this world. History keep repeating itself. Different people, different places, but essentially is the same thing. But I know that when we leave this earth of ours, you young people will carry on for us very successfully. And I, I'm sure you will. Thank you. Dr. Call, would, would you like to say anything? I just have to again say thank you to our friends who support the Holocaust Center, our survivors, our volunteers who are here, and our amazing students from all over the world, Korea, Haiti, right, Panama, New York, <laughs> which is very good. Uh, thank you. You give us not just information, but you give us hope, both from the point of view of survivors, but also from the point of view of our future who are our wonderful students. So thank you, thank you Dr. Fu. I know he's out and about <laughs> preparing for the next event, and thank you Marissa. And thank you to all of you who come to hear this first telling of the story, but we're gonna repeat it. All of our students will make sure that we repeat the story. So thank you, you did a great job. Sue, so you have one last homework assignment. <laughs> Since not all the survivors are here right now, some of them couldn't come today, some had to leave, I need you all to make a promise, all the students, and that promise is that you will continue to tell your survivor's story. <coughs> tell it to your friends, to your family, to your children, and never forget them, what they experienced, so that we can make a better world in the end. Okay? Promise you all do it? Okay. <laughs> all right. Great job, everyone. We'll do some pictures. And